Okay, as it's just turned seven, um, I'll just do a brief introduction. And then um, I've got some slides on grading and classifications. And then I'll be handing over to um, Dr. Andy Greist. Hello, Pau. Hello, everyone. A warm welcome to you tonight um, to Mentor Moch Cymru webinar on an insight at Abbott Well Ever Pig Carcasses. Thank you for joining us. We're delighted to have Dr. Andy Grice from Bristol University with us today for this webinar. Thank you very much, Andy, for your time. Um, if you have any questions during the webinar, uh, please feel free to uh, ask these uh, with the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, and we'll try our very best to answer all of these at the end. Um, therefore, um, that's the brief introduction, and then I'll um, share my screen now um, to do the my slides and then hand over to um, Andy. put my camera off just to have some more um, to make sure my Wi-Fi is clear throughout. Uh, therefore, just a basic introduction on grading and classification to start with. Um, therefore, as you can see here, um, the lean meat percentage um, table um, and pigs are graded um, at the time of weighing. Um, usually this is about 45 minutes um, after they've been slaughtered. Uh, the basic functions of the grading scheme are to make uh, price quotations comparable throughout the all EU member states, enable accurate monitoring of the market situation, um, and to enable producers to be rewarded for producing the carcasses that the market requires. And uh, lastly, to establish an average price for pig carcasses for reference um, price calculations. Um, and all abattoirs that slaughters more than 200 pigs a week are required under EU rules to classify pig carcasses. Um, any pigs that are identified with carcass faults, such as um, any deformity, blemished, and so on, or devalued by um, being partially condemned, are recorded as said on the carcass classification documents. Um, Andy will um, talk more about this, but um, yes, these are recorded as is said. Um, as you can see here, uh, figure one, where the P2 on live pig is. The P2 probe involves a technique of manually inserting a probe to measure back fat and re um, rind thickness. Um, and uh, yeah, the carcass is graded according to the depth, depth of the back fat at the P2 position along the line. Um, and as you can see here, um, it, it is here where the P2 is um, measured. Um, carcasses are graded to give a prediction of the amount of meat which can be sold from it. Um, factors that contribute to increased back fat, um, these may um, be excess intake or irregular intake of feed, pigs fed the wrong diet, um, season can affect this too, um, or maybe poor feed ingredient quality. There are many more factors too, but um, these are the main ones I um, noted here. Um, the um, carcass dressing, as you can see here, there is. Um, two methods of pig carcass dressing in the UK, uh, the EU specification and the um, UK specification. Before weighing the carcass, the following must be removed from the um, EU specification. Uh, UK abattoirs are allowed to present pig carcass according to the UK specification. This means dressing carcasses the same as EU specification, but leaving the following parts in, as you can see here. Um, UK, um, it's up to them to leave the tongue in or take it out. 
but as you can see um, in the list here, these are the uh, things that they have to follow. Uh, trends in carcass weights. Um, uh, you'll also find prices for saucer increase of over certain thresholds. Um, as you know, um, some of you may be aware in your saucer house, um, some apatars may have a max live weight um, and don't have the facilities or the equipment to slaughter pigs um, of certain size. So you have to ensure that they don't go over weight um, for slaughter or that abattoir may not be able to slaughter them. Um, and the UK average death weight is currently um, 95, and this is at a record level. Um, I did look at some figures and back last year, this time last year, uh, the average carcass uh, dead weight was 89 kilo. Um, and this is largely due to the backlogs on farm experience throughout the UK uh, over the last couple of years. Um, and yeah, this little slide here on market types um, and live weight is a good indication of dead weight carcasses use. Um, but as you all know, however, this will very depend on the breed that you have. Um, and traditionally pigs have been finished to meet one of three market types. And these are, um, you can see these in the um, table here. Um, but gaining, Feedback from your customers is crucial, um, of course, to ensure that you are finishing your pigs to their spec. Um, so take into account this when you are finished um, pigs and taking them to slaughter. Um, and yeah, just take, take into mind your end market. Uh, therefore, that's um, all from me on um, grading classification. Um, and now I'll hand over to um, Andy. Um, who will um, go into much more detail about um, the abattoir. Thank you very much, Andy. Hi. Hello. Um, lovely to sort of virtually meet you all or meet all these code names. Uh, one of the things I really struggle with with Zoom is not actually being able to see people. Um, my name is Andy Grist and I work at the University of Bristol, which makes it sound a bit like the start of an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. And I was asked if I'd come along and actually just have a, a brief overview of what happens at abattoirs and things that you can do to try and reduce any wastage from the animals you've spent time rearing. It will be reasonably quick because there's quite a lot to get through. But I have said to Ellen that um, she's got my email. I am more than happy to answer questions if you think of them later on and you want to email me. So it's not just a question of you've had your half an hour and that's it. So what we're gonna look at is trying to look at it in stages. Because quite a few of you will be having the meat back or getting it sent to butchers, we need to understand what has to be done to send the animals into the abattoir, what's causing variations in meat quality, and then some of the reasons for condemnation. Not sure how much help I can be on how to avoid it, but we can avoid some things. And then the tests that are done on the carcasses in terms of public health and animal health. So requirements for sending pigs to the abattoir. Firstly, an abattoir will take your size pigs. That's kind of a given, but becoming more difficult nowadays as we're losing smaller abattoirs and the larger abattoirs don't always want to take private kills. But we do need to be aware of the law in terms of transport for these animals. Movement licenses and identification. Because all of these can mean that an animal that you spent time rearing can be rejected at the abattoir. So transportation law, it's a very stressful experience for the animal. 
they're not used to the floor moving. They're not used to being confined. They do actually suffer from travel sickness. So what we want to do is try and keep the transport as short as possible. Some animals will die due to the cumulative stress of transport. So the longer we transport them, the more stress we're putting that animal under. Not only can they die, we can actually affect the meat because they're not being fed during transport. So because it is such a stressful experience, there is law and it is very prescriptive. And it's enforced by local authorities, so animal health in each area. They actually have the power to stop and inspect any vehicle carrying animals at any point. And if the OV considers an animal's being stressed by transport, they can report themselves and they are supposed to do so. So knowing the law is important. Now, welfare of animals transport is probably one of the most detailed laws that there are. If you're having trouble getting to sleep, get hold of a copy. You'll probably get as far as stocking densities and be away with the pixies. But there are prescribed stocking densities for the animals. But one of the main things that it deals with is whether the animals fit to be transported. Because the actual act of transporting an animal itself is stressful, if the animal's not fit for that journey, we are increasing the stress. So in particular, we should not be transporting animals if they're unable to move independently without pain or walk unassisted. So a lame animal. Most of the animals don't normally lie down in travel. And they're gonna be spending their time moving from side to side on a lame leg. It's gonna be painful. If they have an open wound or a prolapse, they shouldn't be transported. And if they're pregnant females, females are given birth the previous week or young animals, so normally under seven days old. When we refer to pregnant animals, we actually think of the last 10% of gestation. If the OV suspects in a plum, they are supposed to contact training standards and let them know. So we recognize that transporting animals is going to be stressful. We have detailed law as to what can be transported, what can't be transported. And it does say that if there's any doubt, you should contact your vet and ask them their opinion as to whether that animal can be transported. You're also allowed to contact the official veterinarian in the plant and ask what they think, but it should be your vet you contact first. Because everything that is done in an abattoir is listed in law. There's about 40 pieces of law covering what happens in an abattoir. It's the only industry that has a government officer there the whole time enforcing it. So if we have an animal that's been injured during transport or following arrival, the law is very specific. It says that those animals must be killed immediately. Now, if the vet is there, and says that there's no disease, they can go for human consumption. If the vet isn't there, the animal will be killed and put in the bin, which is a complete loss and also a welfare issue. This all sounds very negative, I apologize. So the OV has a duty to report any breaches for investigation. If they consider that the animal's welfare has been affected by transport, they have to report. 
it is then up to the local authority whether they take it further. So it's not the OV at the abattoir being awkward, they have a duty to report. The next one, movement licenses. Most of you are used to this. Pig movements are reported electronically using the EMA, EAML2 system. The reason that pigs are reported electronically, whereas the other species are reported paper-wise, is because during foot and mouth, we suddenly realized that we needed almost real-time information as to where the pigs were. So they are an electronic movement license. And these also include the food chain information, the piece of paper that you used to sign saying that the animals, you consider them fit for human consumption, and they're not in the withdrawal period for any drugs and they haven't been given any drugs recently. Again, any problem with movement licenses and the OV is supposed to report them. So we shouldn't be moving animals that are injured. We shouldn't be moving animals without a movement license. It's just creating an issue that we shouldn't have. One of the things we still have problems with is identification. During movement of animals to abattoir, they should be identified. Now that can be an ear tag, a tattoo or slap mark on the shoulder. It's worth pointing out that if you have an ear tag, it's got to be flame proof. We've actually had a couple of abattoirs have had issues where they use a flame gun to burn the last of the hair and have set light to the pig because of the ear tag. There is a set format for that. We do have small holders that come to the abattoir at the University of Bristol who don't want to do the slap mark because it looked painful. If those animals come off the vehicle and go into the abattoir unidentified, they will be put into the bin. So it's a question of which is worse. <laughs> They should be identified before they're moved. So all pigs under a year moving to slaughter or market must be identified and all pigs over a year old moving anywhere should be identified by either an ear tag, tattoo or double slap mark. When it's going to the abattoir it's really important that they are identified and that is listed on the movement license, movement document. because the legislation is very clear that if they cannot identify the animal, it has to be killed and declared unfit for human consumption. It can't be sent back to the abattoir, uh, back to the farm, because transporting it unidentified is an offence. They can't make the offence worse by transporting it back. So it will be killed and put into the bin. So it's little things that we can do to try and reduce losses of animals you spent time rearing. I almost feel like I should have told you to put your seatbelts on. I never do apologize for the speed of this. So you're gonna be getting meat back, hopefully. So we need to look at things that are gonna cause variation in the meat that you are then selling on. So muscle fatigue, acute stress prior to slaughter, and we'll have a very, very quick look at slaughter methods. I've just spent two days teaching slaughter methods to abattoirs. So we're only gonna to touch on it slightly. <laughs> the first thing we will look at is muscle fatigue. So in the live animal, it's going to use sugar, glycogen. 
same as us, same as every other species. It converts that sugar to energy by a process is about 10 chemical steps. If you're doing pub quizzes, it's called the glycolytic pathway. With the, in the presence of oxygen, so it's breathing, one unit of sugar will produce 36 units of energy. It is really efficient. And the byproducts are carbon dioxide and water. Carbon dioxide, you breathe out. Water, you get rid of another way. When we kill the animal, we affect that process. We don't get the full 10 chemical steps. And it only goes as far as producing a little bit of energy, but also lactic acid. So if you start exercising, you haven't done for a while and you get cramp, that's lactic acid buildup in the muscles. To get rid of it, you well, lie on the floor screaming. So you're taking oxygen and it gets absorbed to produce energy. So when we kill the animal, we are affecting the muscle metabolism. So meat is biochemically and physically different to muscle. Live animal muscle is around 7.4 pH. Most of the body is 7.4. Obviously, stomach acid, bile isn't. But the rest of your body spends a lot of time trying to stay at 7.4. It's where the nerves work best, the brain works best, enzymes work best. When we kill the animal, that acidification that occurs in the muscle will take it down to about 5.5. Once it gets to 5.5, the enzymes stop working. So at the very least, meat is more acidic than muscle. I kind of wish I could see your faces. So when we kill the animal, we are gonna make the muscle more acidic and it will then produce meat. And it takes time and it will drop, well, we like curves because we're at a university. And this is what we call a normal pH fall. If every pig does this, the meat will be the same color. So this is normal. We've got plenty of energy and over 24 hours, it will drop to 5.5. It takes time. So this is nice and simple. If for any reason we exhaust the animal, no energy in the muscles, so we could transport it for a long time. So it's using energy. If they fight in the abattoir, which if all the pigs are the same size and from different family groups, they'll fight to see who's in charge. You don't feed the pigs for 12 hours before slaughter. But what if you extend that and don't feed them for slightly longer because, well, they're just gonna poo it out. It means there's no energy in the muscle, no muscle sugar. And instead of our normal fall, that's when we get dark, firm and dry pork. So the muscle is exhausted before slaughter and we don't get that post-mortem change. And the pH will be up around 6.5. Now the first problem that we have with this is, it's obviously a different color. And if the consumers are looking for normal, anything that's a different color, they automatically assume comes from an older animal and they won't buy it. It's also dry, it is firm. And because the acidity of it is still near seven, bacteria love it. So when we make meat more acidic, we actually 
stops certain bacteria from growing on it and it takes longer to spoil. DFD pork will spoil quite quickly just because the pH is near a seven. So exhausting the muscle for any reason, lack of food, long transport, fighting before slaughter will give you dark, firm and dry pork. And it shows up most predominantly in the loin muscle, so middle of the shop. Sorry, I can't see questions, so <laughs> there we go. Um, it's one of the things that we haven't really looked at. People do recognize that it is a different taste because it's drier. Um, however, some people with beef have actually said that DFD, uh, dark cutting beef, which occurs for the same reason, it's um, actually okay. Spanish bullfighting, they actually want the bull at the end of it because it's always exhausted. The other thing that we can have with pigs, because they are stress susceptible, is you can have acute stress just prior to slaughter. So dark meat, it's difficult to work out where it happens. It could be on farm because of not feeding in the last period. It could be long transport. It could be fighting in the abattoir whilst waiting. But if we've got acute stress, the last four minutes before slaughter, we then have a situation where we have a pig that's got loads of energy. We got that bit right. So it's not gonna go dark. But if we upset it just before slaughter, you get all those fight or flight hormones working. So it's either gonna have a fight or it's gonna run away or both. And everything is working at full speed and then we kill it. So rather than our normal fall, it drops like a stone in about 45 minutes. It will still stop at 5.5 because .5, everything stops at 5.5. .5 it just gets there too quick in a hot carcass and that's when you get pse pale soft exudative the other end of the coin so we've got these three options you want everything to be in the middle we want every pig that we produce to produce the same color meat which means we've got to have plenty of sugar to allow that post-mortem change to occur. But if it's got plenty of sugar and we upset it in the last four minutes before it dies, because we're handling it badly, we're not stunning properly, we'll get PSE. And it's paler than normal. It's soft meat and it will exude fluid. If we exhaust it, we can get dark. Now, in any group of pigs, you'll have a variation of these, but what you want to do is try and keep it as close as possible. So if you're consistently getting pale meat, we've got to be looking at the abattoir and saying, you know, what's happening there? If you're getting dark meat, look at when you feed last journey times, things like that. Although with the lack of small abattoirs now, journey times are always going to be an issue. So as I said earlier, I've spent two days just talking about slaughter methods with abattoirs. It's a very technical thing that's kept me off the streets rather than employed for the last 13 years. There are only a few methods of stunning an animal prior to slaughter. And obviously pigs have to be stunned. We've got electrical head only stunning, electrical head to body stunning, controlled atmosphere stunning, and penetrating captive bolt pistol. 
that's basically what we've got. We're going to look at the first three because penetrating captive bolt is generally only used as a backup in case there's a problem or for emergencies. Because if we use a penetrating captive bolt, they are very effective on pigs, but they kick immediately. It's a good sign that it tells you you've taken the brain out. It's no longer controlling the spinal cord, but they kick so violently that they also cause blood splash, bruising, they can break bones. So for commercial use, penetrating captive bolt isn't used. One of the main ones that's used in smaller abattoirs is electrical head only stunning. And they will use a set of tongs that are electrically live and it passes a current across the brain. There's a minimum current in law, 1.3 amps. So you've got 13 amps coming out of the plug socket. And what that does is it basically fries the computer of the brain. It overstimulates all the brain and it produces a, a state of epilepsy where every neuron in the brain is firing. And during that period, the brain can't function. It can't process pain. The animal is unconscious. And there are behavioral signs that we look for in abattoir that have been found from research. Main one being no rhythmic breathing, no corneal reflex. So during that period, whilst it's epileptic, we will bleed the animal. Normally by a, a chest stick, thoracic stick. And that kills the animal due to lack of oxygen going to the brain. So it's not the lack of blood, it's the lack of oxygen in the blood that kills the animal. And it will kill the animal in about 18 seconds if it's done properly. Definitely before the animal is, would recover. It has to be immediate, any stunning method we use. So electricity applied across the brain will cause brain dysfunction in about 15 milliseconds. And it takes 10 times longer than that to feel pain. So it causes brain dysfunction before the animal can feel it and the animal legally is not allowed to recover. Another system that can be used is head to body. It doesn't tend to be used with pigs so much. Again, we use 1.3 amps to stun the animal, producing epilepsy in the brain. And then just after it's stunned, we then pass electricity from the head to the heart, stopping the heart, cardiac arrest. And that prevents recovery because there's no oxygen going to the brain. A lot of groups were always very keen on the fact you needed a heartbeat to lose blood. You don't. Blood is lost through gravity. The heart operates under pressure. So when you go to the doctors and they take your blood pressure, you have a high number and then a low number. The high number is when the heart squeezes and pushes blood out. And then the heart relaxes and the low number is the pressure that refills it. Once we cut the animal's throat or stop the heart, the heart doesn't refill. It will keep pumping, but it's not pumping blood out. So in this case, bleeding is a quality issue, not a welfare issue, because the animal can't recover because the heart's been stopped. The downside of this is you need to use low frequency electricity to stop the heart, so 50 hertz. When we chose the electrical systems in this country, we actually chose the same frequency that causes cardiac arrest in animals and humans. It's a very small range, but it also means we're affecting the muscle at the same time. So when we use 
cardiac arrest frequencies, we're also going to make every muscle contract and you will get more carcass damage. So it tends not to be the main method used for pigs. The larger abattoirs, and we're talking about 83% of the abattoirs in the UK and Wales that do pigs will use controlled atmosphere stunning. Now, this has been looked at a lot recently. It allows group stunning, so we don't have to get pigs into single file. It means that we can do quite high speeds. It avoids human contact. Pigs in these abattoirs are moved by moving walls rather than having humans, and they don't react so badly, so they're less stressed. Carbon dioxide, which is the gas that's used, actually kills by acidifying the body. So we reduce the pH of the spinal cord and the brain from 7.4 down to 6.8, and that kills it. But because it affects the brain and the spinal cord at the same time, they don't kick when they're unconscious. So that improves quality. All the other methods, you will get kicking because the brain is no longer controlling the spinal cord. So there is a huge improvement in product quality. But we have known for some time that carbon dioxide is noxious. It's the one gas that we and animals can detect physiologically, because it's the one gas our bodies are designed to get rid of. But the handling systems prior to going in the gas are the best I've ever seen. Once they're in the gas, it takes 10 to 12 seconds before they become unconscious. That will be stressful but it's not long enough to produce PSE. But it will be stressful. But the handling, the minutes of handling beforehand are very good. So somehow you can, it almost balances. So whilst I'm doing my flying whistle stop tour, reasons that carcasses are rejected. Probably a good time to say there's a very good book you can buy. I wrote it that says why stuff's rejected, but I'm not going to do that because it costs money. There are basically only three reasons any carcass is going to be re rejected in an abattoir. A legal, straightforward legal reason. It doesn't comply with this. or pathogenic, it's gonna make somebody ill or has the potential to make somebody ill. Obviously that's the main reason for rejecting any meat as unfit. But surprisingly, a lot of the meat that is rejected in abattoirs is for aesthetics. It doesn't look right. And a lot of the product that is rejected is rejected for that. And we're going to look at some of the conditions that we do get in abattoirs. It's not going to be all of them, because I could keep you here for a couple of days doing that. But just some of the main ones that we see. So the legal, well, we've been through these. If it has experienced pain or suffering following transport, or arrival, it must be killed immediately. If the OV hasn't seen it, it will go in the bin. Same as if it can't be identified. If any animal is killed without being seen by the official veterinarian alive, it will go in the bin. And weirdly, that still happens in some abattoirs. It's a mistake but there's no option. It doesn't matter how wonderful the pig is afterwards when they look at the insides. If it's not seen alive and signed for by the vet, it is unfit. And if it has residues of veterinary products in it, it is unfit. 
So these are cast in stone. We're going to talk about Trichinella at the end, but it hasn't occurred in this country naturally since 1953. So things we find. This is looking down a vertebral column. Now this is a pig that had tail bite. Obviously it's something that pigs do, especially if they're bored. But if you have a tail bite, the law has always been very specific. We must split the carcass. And we've had some farmers at our abattoir that were upset because they had pigs that they'd reared for a hog roast and they had to be split. It's not an option. If there's tail bite, they have to be split. And if there's an abscess in the spinal cord, the animal will be rejected. So obviously we want to try and reduce tail biting. Other pathogenic things, this is almost like a, what I did on my holiday photograph session. Pleurisy, which my students call pleuritis now, where you have the outside membrane on the lungs adhering to the thoracic cavity. Obviously this is painful for the pig. It doesn't, in terms of meat quality, tend to be an issue. They will strip the pleura from the inside of the chest cavity. If they can remove it, then the carcass is okay. They just reject the affected part. So the pleura and the affected lungs. If they can't remove it, then they may have to remove part of the rib cage, which means you have a carcass that's devalued. Erysipelas comes in various forms. This was a pig that was in an abattoir for two hours. And during that two hours, it developed erysipelas. Obviously you had it when it came in, but after two hours, they could see it in the live pig. Once the hair is removed, it's even more obvious. Now in this case, if it is just the skin, the skin will be rejected, but then they will look at the heart. If there's any signs in the heart or the kidneys, they will then reject the entire carcass. And erysipelas is something that humans can get. So it kind of makes sense that they're gonna be quite strict with it. Jaundice. It's not so much the jaundice, it's the fact that the jaundice is a sign, A, it's different from normal, but there is a systemic problem that has produced a discoloration, a yellow discoloration of the meat, the fat, the internal organs, and that will be completely rejected. In the live animal, you can see it in the eyes. We can also have part rejections. One of the most common rejections we have in pigs is pneumonia. And we've actually found over the years that transport itself is so stressful, it can bring on a pneumonia in the pig during transport. In these situations, it is normally just the lungs that are rejected but they can also spread to the heart and you end up with a pericarditis, then the heart and lungs will be rejected. Arthritis, so here, looking at your left, the animal's right joint, foreleg joint is swollen. So this is telling the OV that this animal may have had an issue during transport. Was it able to walk properly? Opening the joint in this one, we can see there is quite a strong inflammatory action going on. 
So firstly, it was painful to the animal. Then the OV is going to question, was any treatment given that hasn't been listed? If the farmer noticed. And then we also have the situation that that affected part will be rejected. So they'll remove up to the next available joint. If we have a carcass that's got multiple arthritic joints at the front and back, then the whole carcass will be rejected. And this is a pig that was killed in the layerage because, to be honest with you, there was no way this was going to be fit for human consumption. This is a condition of pyemia. It was opened at the end of the day. The liver was full of abscesses. The lungs were full of abscesses. You can see the abscesses on the outside of the body. It's one of those ones where I've been doing meat inspection for over 20 odd years now. And you're looking at this animal and thinking, um, how the hell did that walk in? They are an amazing species you are dealing with. They will put up with so much. This animal shouldn't have been able to breathe. Its heart was full of pus. It should have died. And surely looking at it, the farmer should have said, well, actually, I'm not sending that in. Septic peritonitis. So we have obviously the peritoneum is inside the abdominal cavity. It lines the abdominal cavity. And one of the nice things about pigs is when they get a septic peritonitis, it goes bright red. And this septic peritonitis came from a hernia, a strangulated hernia. So you can transport a pig with a hernia. It only becomes an issue if it's dragging on the floor and ulcerated, then it becomes a open wound and you can't transport it. Now we all know pigs get hernias. There's almost like a good size for a hernia. You want it big enough, so I'm not saying telling you to grow hernias, but if it's too small, the intestines can go in and block you get a strangulated hernia and then an infection sets in and you get peritonitis and the whole carcass is unfit. Plus you have an animal's in excruciating pain. But if the hernia is slightly larger, the guts can go in and out and there's no issue. So weirdly, there is such a thing as a good sized hernia, but what we want to do is not have any. So a hernia itself, unless it's infected, will just be rejected for aesthetic reasons, but it will be rejected from the carcass. One of my students' favourite ones, milk spot. The actual technical term is chronic focal interstitial hepatitis because, well, they're vet students, they're going to be paid by the syllable. And it's more accurate. But milk spot is such a beautiful description. It's scarring left by the migration of the larva of the pig roundworm, a scarus serum. Now you can't get it from eating it. It's rejected because of aesthetics. The legislation says if it's infected by parasites or the effects of parasites, it must be rejected. So all that was caused by these. On farm, it's going to reduce feed conversion rate, but it's very difficult to get rid of. You will lose the liver if it's got scarring. But the life cycle of this worm, it goes from the liver to the lungs, gets coughed up and swallowed again, and then develops into an adult. So you can also get lung lesions, which can get secondary infections. I have seen a couple of pigs that had so many of these that they actually blocked the intestines and produced jaundice. 
fight marks. Pigs, well, they don't fight during transport because it's too novel and stressful. When they get to the abattoir, they'll spend about 10 to 15 minutes mooching around, looking at all the strange things. Then after that period of time, they'll look at each other and say, right, who's in charge? And they'll fight to sort out dominance unless they've already done it on farm. But if you send pigs from different pens because they're the same size and that's what you want, they may fight in the abattoir. And because they're the same size, they can fight until they're exhausted. The a skin, if it's badly affected like this one, will be rejected as unfit for human consumption for aesthetic reasons. But also you've got a pig that's been using energy just before slaughter, so it's likely to go dark as well. So quickly on to tests. This really is a fly through, I do apologize. So trichinella. One of the reasons that certain religious groups don't eat pigs was basically trichinella. It's one of the main reasons. Now, trichinella spiralis is microscopic. It forms cysts in muscles with the worm twisted inside it. And if we eat raw or undercooked meat of animals with larva in it, we will get trichinella. Now these worms hatch out in the intestines and then burrow into cells, which means that we're gonna get gut problems. They then release eggs that hatch, go through the body and then form cysts in our muscles, which means we then get muscle problems. So, it is an issue, which is why it is tested for. All breeding domestic pigs will be tested and pigs from non-controlled housing have to be tested. The test is quite quick, but it does mean that there may be a day, day and a half delay before you get your animals back whilst they're waiting the results because if they take a test, they can't release that carcass until they got the results of that test. Trichinella is a horrible parasite. So depending on how many you eat, it will start off with nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, and then you get fatigue, fever. That's where the adults are, are destroying the cells in your stomach lining in your intestines. And then as the larva migrate through the body, you get headache, fever, chills, you can get cough if they go to the lungs, swelling, edema in the face, and then aching joints and muscle pain. And depending on the muscles it affect, if it affects the heart, you can have cardiac issues. If it affects the diaphragm, you can have breathing issues. It is a horrible parasite and it's microscopic. Now, to try and help a little bit, we haven't had it in the UK naturally since 1953, but we still have to test. It is present in Europe, not present in the UK. The last non-natural case we had, I think was in 2000, when fourth, households got it they got eight eight people got it in four households in liverpool where they bought back pork salami from serbia because it survives the process that makes salami but naturally occurring 1953 but we still have to test so samples of meat from the diaphragm will be taken from the pigs and sent for specific tests they basically digest the muscle and look for the cysts with a microscope. The other test that's done is residue sampling. Now this is done at random. 
throughout the month in every abattoir. And it comes, uh, basically each abattoir is told how many samples to take each month and what species to take it from. And this is purely to see if there's any unauthorized veterinary products in the meat. You're asked to declare if you've given any drugs and whether it's gone past its withdrawal period. This is just a counter check. And it is done on a random basis. However, the OV can take samples if they suspect drugs may be present. So if they see a, a recent uh, wound that's healing, they may question whether it's been given antibiotics or anything like that. Then they can also take samples. Now these samples are taken under strict conditions and everything is witnessed and they go into basically police evidence bags because if drugs are found above the limit or an unauthorized substance, they will investigate the farm and try and work out whether it was a genuine mistake or whether it was a problem. And we have had problems in the UK with, especially with our ability to order things online. Just because it's legal for use in somewhere like the USA doesn't mean that it's legal for use in the UK. So again, you know, talk to your vet. It may, you may be able to get something that does the same thing cheaper from elsewhere, from abroad, but it may be cheaper for a reason. And it may mean your carcass is rejected and you're investigated and possibly prosecuted for it. Wow, that was a bit of a fly through. I do apologize. <laughs> so now um, apparently we have a question and answer session, assuming that any of you are still awake. <laughs> Great, thank you very much for that brilliant, yeah, overview of um, the abattoir. Um, hopefully everybody, I've definitely learned so much from that um, webinar. So thank you very much, Andy. No problem. Um, and as I said before, if you do have questions you think out later, Great. please email and I will answer. I've just got a few, um, points from Mentor Mark Cymru, what we have to offer, and then um, we'll finish with a Q&A, Andy. Okay. Um, so, is it possible if you just, um, yeah, stop sharing your screen just for a minute? Yeah, hang on a second. That's okay. There we go. Oh, lovely. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so um, Mentor Mark Cymru, um, what we have to offer, um, what the project has to offer to, for your businesses, um, we have Herd Health Plan, 100% um, fully funded, up to £400 um, to get a vet over to your farm to go over um, and create a Herd Health Plan specific to your herd. Um, and this could reduce a lot of um, the common condemnations we've just spoken about. So, yeah, please get in touch, um, contact us, and we can arrange um, yeah, for the Herd Health Plan to be carried out on your um, farm. Uh, also, we have a butchery and processing course in March. Um, this is in North Wales, um, in Llangevny on Anglesey, um, on the 15th and the 16th of March. So um, contact me. Contact details are on social media or on the Contact Us tab on um, the website. We are also um, have a study tour on the 28th to the 30th of March. Um, more info will be released on this soon but keep an eye out on social media um, and on our website for more information um, regarding um, where we are going and so forth on that. Um, but otherwise, um, we are here to help. So give us a call if you have any questions or would benefit from any of um, the Herd Health Plan or would like to attend the butchery and processing um, that we have on in March. Um, therefore, we'll go on to the Q&A now, if that's okay. Uh, one question that's come in, Andy. Yep. Is long distance, well, yeah, this has been answered really, but um, it has come in um, 
previously. So is long distance uh, detrimental to pigs? Yes. Full stop. Yeah. Um, the longer you transport them, more will die. They're using energy, therefore the meat will change. And uh, novel stress like confinement, the vehicle moving, overheating, um, you know, simple things. People forget that on a vehicle, there's no air conditioning in the back. And if the vehicle's not moving, there's no airflow and the animal will heat up. Um, qualifying long distance <sighs> is difficult, is the answer that I do have some information on it, but not to hand. So I don't want to give you an answer and find out it's... Um, yeah. So, it, and also it depends on the pig. If the pig is quite a stressy pig, then really any distance is going to be stressful. Mm. Uh, but in terms, uh, when we last looked at it, I think we were looking at anything over 100 kilometres, then you start to have issues compounding, if that helps at all. <laughs> okay, no, great. Thank you very much. Um, another question, is there a vet in every abattoir, um, mm. even in the small ones? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. one of the pieces of legislation that says there must be a vet, pre the government vet present. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, oh, sorry, a follow on question from the um, long distance. What do you quantify as long distance? Um, well, in the UK, you're looking at anything. Um, where they'd have to take a break so probably eight hours is long long distance but you're going to get the effects um the legislation doesn't apply if you're transporting less than or not all of it applies if you're transporting less than 50 kilometers so it's almost like they're saying that up over 50 kilometers is when you start getting major issues the legislation is very complicated and applying it is quite difficult mm. and it also applies to all uh, animals so when i go to work with my dogs they don't follow the legislation because i'm not making money from them but if i took them to film an advert for dog food and got money for it then i'd have to follow the legislation it's all very weird as to how it's applied, but moving pigs to slaughter, it will apply. But different rules come in after 50 kilometers. <laughs> Welcome to my world. <laughs> <laughs> um, another question, what are the factors affecting the hearing? Uh, generally the pig. So pig breed. Uh, most people, most of the abattoirs prefer land race, things like that. If you're doing anything with dark dark hair on it, so Iron Age type, uh, Gloucester Old Spot, dark hair is more difficult to remove. Um, also, if the pig's cold, it can affect, because it almost holds onto the hair more. Mm. Although then most of them are going through a tank of water, if it's been cold prior to that, it may not dehair. And you'll normally find that if they can't dehair bits, it's normally the head. So they may reject the head for contamination because they can't remove all the hair from it. Okay, okay thank you very much. Um, another question, thank you for all these questions. Um, can you give a quick refresher on the chronic tonic, uh, tonic extractor stages of stunning? Yeah, um, when you first apply electrodes or anything like that, you will get a tonic phase where the four legs are extended, hind legs are pulled in, it's all tight. And that generally, with electricity, lasts for about 10 seconds. And then it will start uncontrolled physical activity. It's a bit like you taking a head off a chicken all the time. The brain is controlling the spinal cord. If you take the brain out successfully, you will get enhanced spinal reflexes, so kicking. So that's the clonic phase. The thing is you won't have rhythmic breathing during both phases. And that's why we don't use captive bolts on pigs because they don't do that 
10 seconds of tight tonic, they go immediately clonic and they can keep kicking for minutes because they're white muscle fiber, fast twitch muscles. They react differently to stunning. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, I think we've gone through all the questions now. Thank you very much for everybody for posting them. Um, and I think we're all done there now, Andy. Thank you very much once again no um, for a brilliant webinar. Um, and thank you everybody for joining. Um, my colleague has just put a um, the evaluation form in the chat. We would be very grateful um, if you could um, complete this so that we have um, some yeah, feedback and help us for future events to plan. So share your suggestions and we can look into them to see what we can plan as an agenda uh, for the coming months. Um, therefore, um, I think we've come to an end there, Andy. Thank you. Um, thank you everybody for joining. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed the session. And um, yeah, thank you Andy for your time. Very no graceful. Worries. Speak to you soon. All right, bye. Thank you, bye.